welcome everybody. Uh, I hope you're staying safe and well from wherever you are around the world. I know we've got people joining us from around the globe and it's super exciting to have you here. My name is Colin Giles. I am the head of animation here at Vancouver Film School and just super excited and thankful to welcome uh, one of our most esteemed alumni, Lino DeSalvo, back in the house, live from Montreal, uh, from where all the action's happening right now. And uh, Lino, welcome. Thanks for being here again, sir. Thanks, buddy. G great to see you, man. You and your shirt. Oh, me and my shirt. You're looking, uh, you're looking pretty, uh, pretty slick there over there too, looking like a director. Um, uh, oh, I have to, uh, Matt, hang on. Max is sending me a message. We, we've got Max Harvey on the, on the back end of the IT here. Um, so I've got to uh, enable HDMI optimize here. Hang on, because I think I'm looking a little, maybe looking a little rough around the edges. Um, hang on, one second here. There we go. Boom. Wow, well, okay, I just read a question. Someone is watching from New Zealand. That is New awesome. Zealand. Hey. That's All crazy, right. So he has got questions. Awesome. Can you share where I get those shirts? Uh, where did I get the shirt? I think this is probably. <laughs> this is, might even be like. This is just cheap old navy, I think. This is not Lululemon. They don't they don't sell anything this cool yet, but they will. Um, welcome everybody. Great to have you here again. Hope you're hope you're doing well from wherever you are. Um, for those of you who maybe are current students or maybe were around uh, earlier this year and into last year, you might have even met Lino at some point throughout our journey. Uh, Lino's been just so gracious with his time uh, with us. You can find. Uh, on the Storyteller Studio podcast, Lino was a guest on there. I was hosted by Christopher Bennett, a great, great episode of that show. Uh, and then just before, um, I guess it was just before Christmas season last year, around the time that Playboy Mail came out, uh, Lino was gracious again to come out to Vancouver, uh, spend some time with us and was in us, uh, in our AMA studio, which was just an, an awesome evening. Uh, and that will be coming to a YouTube near you very soon on our, on our channel. So lots of information coming from, from Lino. Um, for those of you who maybe are not as familiar, maybe you're, uh, you're just kind of new here at VFS or you're just, you're just popping in because you're a fan of the movies Lino's worked on, uh, or as we mentioned, a fan of Adam Lambert, uh, then we've got some stories coming your way. But certainly uh, Lino's journey began at uh, Vancouver Film School and we're honored to call him a, an alumni. And, and Lino hails from New York City the fine, fine city of New York and, you know, started his, his days as a, as flinging pizzas and then has gone all the way through VFS into, uh, you know, starting with Disney right after, pretty much right after school, Inspector Gadget, uh, all the way through uh, Bolt, Tangled, a little movie called Frozen, uh, and then has now taken the, just the most ultimate leap to becoming a director, writer, and producer with uh, last year's Playboy Mail movie and now on to some amazing uh, projects upcoming, uh, all based out of Montreal. So Lino DeSalvo, welcome aboard. What we're gonna be talking about today is something a little different. We got some different plan for you. Um, we're gonna be talking about the top 10 things that Lino wishes he would have known as a junior artist, junior animator just starting out. So he's gone, what is it, 23, 24 years now in this industry. Uh, and just some of the people you've been able to work with, other directors and artists. I mean, you've just been inspired all along that way, and you've picked up all kinds of stuff, not to mention your own experiences. So, um, yeah, Lino DeSalvo, welcome back, and I'm looking forward to hitting these top 10. Yeah, it's what I want to talk about is um, the first few years working, my experience was working at Disney at a VFS, so I'm, I'm really lucky. Technically, it was. Dream Quest images. Um, but what I want to talk about is there are certain things um, uh, as, a, as a rookie animator and as a, uh, as a first time supervising animator, first time director, uh, there, there are certain things no one ever, like there's no playbook. There's no, uh, hey, here's a manual and here are the things. Don't stress out about X, Y, Z. So if I can save anyone years of anxiety and stress, this is something I've, I've wanted to talk about for a while. Um, uh, and, you know, you say, you know, sometimes you learn more from creative setbacks than you do your successes. And um, I feel like in my career, I've had both. But, so I put a top 10 list together. Um, 
that we can go through. And then obviously what we're doing a Q and A, right, Colin? Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do a Q and A for sure. So uh, actually, that's a, it's a good reminder for all of you who are on this right now. If you do have a question, you can type that question in uh, down in the Q and A button there. If you're on mobile, it'll be at the top, and if you're on your desktop, it'll be at the bottom. I don't know why they do that, but that's just the way it is. Thank you, Zoom. Um, and yeah, let's let's hit some questions at the end here. And I'm sure this top ten list. Uh, we're bringing back the old David Letterman show here on on our industry online talks at VFS. So uh, yeah, feel feel free to knock out a question there, and we'll get to you uh, most certainly as soon as we can afterwards. So this is probably be, you know 30 40 minutes of the top ten, and I'm excited to get to it. So here we are. You've come off directing a movie. You're developing new projects. You're pitching projects. Um, you know we're in this. You know obviously we'll be topical about this at times too. This is a different situation, but just in general, uh, Lino De Salvo is coming out of VFS, fresh-faced, uh, probably a bit sleepy after pulling all those hours on the shift work on the computers. And uh, what's the what's the number ten? What's this, you know, magical number ten piece of advice that you give yourself just coming right out of school? So, so my number ten that I wish I knew when I was starting out in the industry. It actually has nothing to do with animation. <laughs> What it has to do with is, um, is, is being kind. So when you start off in the industry, it's such a stressful environment. You're new, you've got a lot of pressure put on you. You're being launched on shots. It's really intimidating. And, um, you think when you first start off as an animator, you think every single thing that you do, that you, that you need to hit a home run, that you need to blow everybody away. Like, oh, I'm gonna show them how good I am. It's, it's again, you need to be, I, I think the craft of animation is, is, um, is, is, is having your stuff look surprising and, and organic and real in the movie, but it takes so much planning and it's a very, it's a, um, it's a high pressure situation. So I wish somebody would have told me, um, be kind, be respectful to people. It's everyone is going through the same exact thing. When you're sitting there in dailies and and you're looking at around how awesome everyone is in the room. Um, I put so much pressure on myself that I wish someone would have pulled me aside in the, my first few years at Disney and they would have said, you know, just relax, dude. <laughs> Enjoy the moment, take it all in. You've got a lot to learn. Um, Oh. And and be kind and be nice to people and be respectful. Um, and I, I promise that kind of stuff gets, it will come back to you. Um, and, and this kind of segues into my um, part two of 10 <laughs> is um, I know a lot of really, really talented animators. Um, but if you're a jerk, uh, people aren't going to want to work with you. So uh, you you need you need to understand uh, that we're not we're not in an industry where we're a bunch of machines and um, uh, my animation is so good my animation is so fresh that I'm going to blow everybody away and I can be and I can be a jerk that it does not work that way. If you're a kind person. Um, uh, and, and, you're, and you're listening to what's going on in the room at dailies and during issuing, uh, and, you're, and, you're, and, and, you're, and you're kind and you're respectful, um, uh, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna do really well in the industry. Is that, Colin, do you, you know what I'm saying? Oh, a hundred percent. Like I, I, I know myself, I mean, especially after doing it, you know, almost a similar amount of time, 20 years, and, and my experience has is, is been in multiple studios. So my, every time I transition to a different job or a different studio, you realize that you need to reestablish yourself just as a, as a person and as a professional. And that kindness can go a long way, you know, and sometimes, and kindness doesn't necessarily mean being a pushover either, right? Like I'm gonna do everything and just be like a, 
like a brown noser, but you definitely want to be, um, I think you're, the word you use there is amazing, respectful. You know, be, be humble and be respectful of other people. Um, and, and what I find is that builds trust, right? Like you're building that trust amongst your colleagues. Some of them will become lifelong friends and some people will only be in that situation during that production. But I think- um, and, the industry, and the industry is small. Yeah. The industry is small and you know, there, there's a chance that you're gonna hop around from show to show and on different projects. <laughs> Everyone knows each other. Um, I get calls weekly from from colleagues and other studios hiring supervisors and and animators. Do you know this person? Um, you know, again, you're be kind, be respectful, put in the hard work, be a sponge. You know, you're going to learn through osmosis by being around these incredibly talented artists at these studios. Take it all in. Um, uh, uh, and, and you're gonna have a really wonderful and enjoy your career a little bit more and not be so uh, uh, so so concerned. And uh, cause you know, you know what happens is there's something in the industry too that's really shitty um, that everyone needs to be aware of is there's almost, it's almost cool to, to shit on your, on your own work. Right. Right, like, oh, this sucks, I stuff, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, being really critical with other people's work too. It's like, listen, everyone is busting their ass trying to make their work look as, as great as it can. Sometimes your cast shots that are probably outside of your comfort range, those shots are tough, man. Um, and then obviously, you know, I think if you're working with a really good supervisor and the show has... It's cast. I'm actually jumping into another number in our. <laughs> but, um, uh, you can make an animator look really good or really bad depending on how you cast them. So th that's another number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think too. A part, part to to go back to like being kind and like being humble is like, like when you come out of high school and you go to art school, you're like, oh crap, everybody's good here. They're all like, I was the best in my high school, and now I'm just like middle level. And then you go to like someone like Disney or really, let's face it, any studio right now worth their ilk is hiring top-notch artists. So just, there's amazing artists everywhere. And you go into a studio and you're like, well, I was the top of my class in animation school. And now I'm just like bottom of the rung, right? And you've got to be able to, to develop those relationships with people. And, and, and that comes from, I, I, I totally agree. It comes from kindness. It's something that gets, uh, it gets overlooked. I think, you know, there's a competitive nature to animation, especially in and like specifically to animators um because it's your work is like you're vulnerable man like you're putting your you're putting your heart on the screen and so if you can be respectful of other people's work like even if you put put up a shot in dailies and it's like it just falls flat the director's like nope um you know you just it's, go up to that and, the, I, and I pat him on the back there. right and i've been there and it's the worst feeling a jam-packed dailies room your shot goes up and it's a complete redo it's devastating yeah. Um, you know, and then you have those times too where it goes up and you get the laugh and you know, and sometimes you even get an applause. Yeah. Um, but yeah, be 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 kind and it feels good as well. You know, being unselfish with your time and getting critiques and, and giving critiques and asking coworkers do they do they need fresh eyes on something? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, it's like pay it forward. It'll come back to you, right? It, and then, and then it just—it's like a—it's just—it's uh, like a snowball effect. It just builds and builds and builds. So, what what is number nine? So, number nine is um, uh, use your downtime wisely. Mm. So, if you're lucky enough to work at a big studio, um, there's a really good chance that between projects there's going to be some amount of downtime. Um, my first few projects that I worked on many, many, many years ago, um, I was like, great. I'm not doing anything. This is awesome. I, I got, this is great. What a mistake. Some of the most innovative, compelling things that I saw in animation was someone that had an idea, 
had the initiative, got a bunch of artists together, and they did something that um, in many ways either raised the bar for the next project, influenced the directors for an upcoming film. They themselves got noticed and became directors. Um, and then a, a quick story about me is, um, uh, I think we were just finishing up a movie called Kangaroo Jack. I'll be shocked if anyone's heard of this. It's actually, our, our work was really good on it. And Disney was crewing up for Chicken Little. And, um, and there was a small group of animators. The, the department was called the Secret Lab, where we were doing Reign of Fire, 102 Dalmatians, um, uh, and some ancillary projects. And they were crewing up for Chicken Little. And, um, and I, I heard through the grapevine that I wasn't on the list to stay. Mm. So um, Disney was working on this project that had a CG Donald Duck in it. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and I remember feeling like uh, if I don't take the initiative right now, and I don't do something to show the upcoming filmmakers um, that I have the chops to work on a cartoony animated show. Um, uh, I'm, I'm probably on the chopping block. And now in hindsight, I look back and I was right. So <laughs> what I did was I animated this fun little scene with Donald Duck. And I took the initiative to call Mark Dindle over, who's directing Chicken Little. And I was like, Mark, let me show you something. Um, and I showed him my, my test for Donald Duck. And because I took that initiative, um, I stayed. And I ended up staying at Disney for you know, almost 17 years after that. Um, so yeah, number nine is use your downtime wisely. Wisely, um, yeah. Listen, especially now, the landscape of animation has changed. It used to be there were six studios in Hollywood. Um, uh, you had to check every single box for a really big, wide general audience. Um, we're not, it, 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 that's not happening anymore. There are streamers. You can make a movie uh, that's a lot more niche and more personal to you, completely different visual style. You can flex your muscle, show the world what you've got, and um, what a time to be creating content and animation. I mean, look at Sony Pictures Image Works, right? Yeah. Um, dude, I think what's so badass about Sony right now is not only are Phil and Chris developing like really emotional cool stories but the visuals are matching the storytelling so, yeah like the projects all look so different there's not a house style and that is so rad with the leadership dude you know what kind of guts that takes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to be like hey the next movie is going to look completely different from the one before <laughs> and, the, and the one before that one is going to look completely different so bravo to Sony Pictures um, uh, Animation. Um, I know they're motivating me. And every time they do something, I'm like, holy shit, I want, I want some of that in my project. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, take, uh, sorry, I went off on a tangent. Take, uh, take advantage of your downtime. Well, it's almost like Sony's taking advantage of any, well, they're making downtime for themselves by doing R&D and pushing themselves. And, and I'm developing a workshop right now for school called purposeful practice and in fact i was supposed to do this in montreal in june at the effects festival but of course we were we were uh, canceled but i i find especially and, and i'm and i'm only talking about this because i find it in myself especially as you get older and more experienced that it's easy not to practice it's like athletics right like you you can't just keep making the same mistake twice and then at the end of the day you're like why am i not good at golf you know it's like well because you're not purposely practicing, you're not applying lessons, you're not pushing yourself, 
you know, being fearless and getting other people's opinions or calling over a director of the next movie and saying, Hey, just putting it all on the line. Right. Like that's, that, that takes guts and it takes fearlessness. Here we go. Love to number it. seven. Numbers. Yeah. Here we go. Next one. Number, I wish we had a graphic. Oh. Yeah. Um, and, and this, uh, uh, wait, are we in number eight or number seven? Oh, number eight. Number eight. Yeah, here we are. Number eight. Number, number eight. eight. Number eight. Uh, um, this, dude, this one is so simple, but believe it or not, I, I struggled with this one for quite a few years. When you are launched in your issuing session, and you get your set of shots, do not leave that room if you are not 100% clear on what you need to be doing. I repeat, <laughs> do not leave that room without asking questions. I know this sounds like duh, <laughs> but there's something that happens to young artists when you get in a room and you've got the producer, the director, the head of animation, the supervising animators, and a room full of artists that you respect, um, that when you're given the assignment, you are just like, oh yeah. Um, so obviously take notes, but if you're, un you, you're allowed to have a conversation. Yeah, if yeah, you yeah. know what you're going to be issued before that moment, um, you know, if you had a brief from your supervisor about like, oh, you're getting these sets of shots, use the issuing session um, to ask questions. I was thinking about doing this. You know, the way I worked at Disney was I shot live action of myself. So um, like my wife and I for Tangled, she helped me. Like I animated the Flynn dying shots and my wife helped me with, with all of that stuff. So <laughs> when I went into my issuing sessions, you know, you got Glenn Keane sitting there <laughs> and um, and it's just like it's so easy just to be like, oh my god, I'm not worthy. Go go in there, show them your live action, tell them, you know, let them know I'm about to do this. Um, get notes from them, and have a dialogue. Uh, but listen, I know it sounds so stupid, simple, but <laughs> I didn't know this for the first few years. And I listen to this day. I know animators are going back going like what the f were they talking i don't even know what the hell i'm supposed to be doing like they were contradicting <laughs> each other it's confusing the director said one thing the soup said another say that in the room say you're confused it's okay <laughs> yeah because it's only going to hurt you in the long run right it's only going to make everybody else's job more impossible right because then what you do is you call in the soup you're confused they sense your frustration. And then I think as soon as you get to a place where you're feeling anxious and frustrated, um, you can't be creative. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. So work, That's the, <laughs> it's like a blockade. Dives, right. I remember I had a shot cast to me uh, when I was working for Disney Interactive. It was goofy. And the direction was, make it funny. And I left there going like, you know, this young scared kid going like, yeah, I'll make it funny. And then sitting at my desk for like four hours going like, I don't know what funny is. I don't know what, it was just, a, what a mess. So I never made that mistake again. Cause then it just takes you like, what could have been two or three simple questions, a dialogue, we would have nailed it, done it, ship it, you know, then you, then your confidence builds too, right? Yeah. And I, listen, obviously there's a way and you'll, um, and when you all get your the, the you know your animation gig, there's obviously tact involved in it, right? Yes. You know, and and again that comes that comes with time, but um, leadership loves that, by the way, too. Our mm -hmm. animators that are um, that are engaged, leadership loves that. Like, yeah. oh, he took the initiative. He was confused and he spoke up. Um, she don't understand what's going on. So she spoke, like that stuff goes a long way, especially for a really um, junior animator to show that level of, um, of, of, uh, of intelligence and awareness that they don't understand exactly what they should be doing. Um, 
I'm going to make you guys look good. So, so listen to num that, that one. That's an important one. <laughs> that is a good one. It's like when we go through reviews, like staff reviews, uh, I always like the give a shit level, like the meter of like, do you give a shit about your job? Like, I don't care if you're awesome at your job. Like you're not, everyone's going to have a hero day, right? Once in a while. But if you just give a crap and you come into an office or you take the initiative to go, look, here's, here's where I'm, I'm missing some information, man, that just, that goes a long way. And that, you know, that probably goes even outside of animation, just any profession actually really is. That's great. That's great advice. Yeah. Um, all right, number, number seven. seven. Yeah. Number seven. Um, uh, again, this one seems pretty straightforward, but um, number seven is uh, <laughs> talk to the animators working around your shots. Talk to the artists that are working mm -hmm. in the in, in in continuity of yours not only directly before and after your series of shots um uh uh yeah what's really important and again this is something it's it's intimidating sometimes you feel like are you bugging somebody the sooner you all can get a sense of what the heck is happening in the sequence Especially that you know what um, where you're going with the acting in the sequence. Um, everyone's life is just going to be that much easier. So get involved with the sequence with the group, right? Right. Um, right. Uh, and 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 talk to people. Get get look for trends in in the notes, especially from the people working surrounding your particular shot. Get notes. Right, but like you know, get people's thoughts because if you hear certain trends coming in the notes, there's a good chance that there's something they may not be know know how to fix it, but that trend is is important. Yeah, especially like performance, like character specific things you can pick up on, like oh, all those other animators kept getting picked on. The character shouldn't be doing X, Y, or Z, and then you can just go and go. Oh, okay, well, yeah, now now I know where not to go, which can just be as helpful as knowing where to go. Yeah, and and um, so so that's gonna actually segue for me. Um, uh, uh, oh yeah, and then a note too for first time supervisors and leads is, um, and I, I I spoke about this briefly just before. For first time soups and leads, um, you can make or break an animator's career by miscasting them. Right. By casting an animator the wrong sets of shots, you can literally destroy them. I've, it, it, it's incredible how, um, uh, you know, so you, as a soup, you have a responsibility. As a lead, you have a responsibility to make sure, yes, of course you want to give animator stuff so that they grow and they can get out of their comfort zone. Um, but you know, a lot of animators that are really good at the subtle emotional stuff, if you gave them a huge cartoony physical comedy gag oriented thing, they're gonna fall flat on their face, right? So like, again, it's, it's, it's something that feels intuitive and again, simple and straightforward, but holy cow. I see first time leads and supervisors because you're in that room and you're shuffling pieces around and I just need someone to do these few shots. Oh, that animator is available. Just give it to them. No, like you need to do more work than that. Like as, a, and again, the more you're a soup and you're a lead and you know, I was the head of animation. Uh, uh, and at that mo at that time, you know what everyone what their comfort zone is. It, we're, you know, animators are like actors, right? You cast them to their strengths. If you put Robert De Niro um, in some slapstick co physical comedy, it's going to be a disaster. Um, <laughs> uh, so again, um, th that's something I wanted to mention too for first time soups and leads. Absolutely. I think it's, you know, part of where communication comes in. You get to know your, your crew and you, you direct them in the right way and, and everyone gets to shine at that point. 
and then that's going to segue, Colin, into number six. six. My the number six is um uh and then number six is be aware of the emotional crescendo of the sequence mm. and um and the only way i really learned about this is my wife is an actor and when she was bringing home her work of breaking down a character i, I kept hearing her use this term emotional crescendo so I would audit her acting class and one or Laughlin, the acting coach, uh, wonderful, um, wonderful acting coach. Um, it's something that uh, when I heard about what it is, it changed my, my career as an animator. <laughs> I, looked at, I looked at sequences completely different. So when I say be aware of the emotional crescendo of the sequence, um, what I mean is what, is, what is the highest point emotionally of that sequence and what is the lowest point? Who is leading that sequence, right? Obviously there's, there's a protagonist in the movie, but sometimes you're given a sequence where either the protagonist isn't in it or it's not their sequence. Um, and th the group of animators needs to know the sequence is, is crescendoing at this particular shot in the sequence. Mm -hmm. So the value in knowing what the sequence crescendo is, is, and again, I wish somebody would have told me this. <laughs> it's okay for you to be animating something very quiet. This may not be your opportunity to be animating something on 10. <laughs> right? It may be the perfect thing for you to do maybe just feeding into the emotional crescendo so that from 10 scene from 10 shots from now boom that shot is able to like just feel really loud and that shot's going to work because you knew the emotional crescendo of it and played it down a bit um to me there's nothing more exhausting than when you're watching an animated movie and the first five shots <laughs> Right, they're shouting at you, and, yeah. and every animator has got the volume <laughs> down to twelve, and and everyone's trying to outdo the the, the next, <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> and you know, I, I'm you know I'm a I'm a Disney person. I came up through that system, and and I'm proud I'm proud of it, and um, it's something that I feel like. I, I'm proud of with, you know, Tangled and Frozen is I feel like there's a really easy movies to watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, I think it's because you're, 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 you're watching the acting, you're staring at the character's eyes and you're totally pulled into the story. And, um, and that's how I felt watching Spider-Verse mm. from Sony is like, there's so much restraint on the artist, right? Because like there's this cool uh, visual style in Spider-Verse and, and it's just like, fuck man, I want this to rock, right? I want to do <laughs> something really graphic and cool. And it's wonderful when you see the animators, you know, pull, pull it back a little bit. And then yeah. man, when you finally see those eyes get emotional, it's, it's like, yeah, man, it's, it's a, uh, that, that's that's one of the reasons why I love animation is is conducting right the emotional crescendo of those sequences. It, uh, um, yeah, it's really really cool to be able to bring the audience in with subtlety. Yeah, yeah. To me, I feel like that's one of the reasons, and this is you know to maybe a specific example that the Let It Go sequence or song is so popular is because it's so clear her crescendo at the end of that song you know, where she starts at the beginning, she's got the cape and the gloves and she's literally stripping all that off. And then she's peeling all those layers of herself and becoming her true self. Like, I mean, that, what a powerful, powerful sequence uh, for people to, like you say, be drawn into. And that crescendo, you know, while being built with the music and the lighting, of course, just the performance of that and the animators knowing, okay, my, my shot is 
first three shots, you know, it's like, Hey, she's, she's here. And Hey, I get the big, you know, dress shot, whatever. But, you know, I feel like that was a universally a successful sequence because it was just, it just nailed all the right notes. Yeah. And I think Tangled, um, uh, obviously Glenn Keane is a huge part of, of that movie. Yeah. Um, but you know, my, my kids watch Tangled and Frozen often. And I think there's something to be said about, um, you know, su subtleties in acting and that no matter what your age is, uh, you get it, right? Like your audience is very, very smart. Like they'll get what the character's feeling without doing a, hmm, yeah. right? Um, uh, yeah, being emotionally specific about what the character's feeling at that moment is, is such a key part of, especially feature animation, but really just any animated performance or really any actor should be able to be able to, to take that too. Cause that's where you're borrowing these, these lessons from, right? As you said, from your, from your wife's acting coach, it's like, these are pure performance uh, tips. So great stuff. Um, have we hit number five? We actually just overlapped with number five. Boom, boom, boom. Number, my number five was, um, uh, I wish, Number five is, is in many situations, um, subtle animation uh, is, is where, you need, where you need to be. Um, mm. And I wish, I, again, such a simple thing. But I wish I knew that. Because the thing is, what you're going to be, what, what, what all of you are going to be feeling with your first job is I need to show them what I can do. And that feeling of like, I need to stay. I want to be here. I love this job. Um, doesn't necessarily, uh, that mentality doesn't necessarily fit with like this very specific shot that you're animating. Right. Um, right. Right. Like the shot that you're animating is this potentially connective tissue shot. Mm hmm where the character needs to um, uh, head down and they're just running from left to right. That's your shot, <laughs> right? Um, and maybe what that shot needs is a bit of imperfection. That shot needs you to take it out of a cycle and let them run, slip a little bit, catch themselves, and then keep running. Maybe they're like freaked out and afraid. Maybe it's a little glance back. That simple, done. If you do that as a rookie animator and you show that amount of, um, of awareness that you know where your shot sits, uh, oh my God, the studio is going to love you. <laughs> oh you yeah, know, you'll be a chance, director's best friend. There's a really good chance that as a rookie animator, you animate that and it looks like, oh my God, <laughs> you're over animating the living shit out of it. And then you're going to spend the next two weeks, tone it down, dial it back. It's still too big. It's still too <laughs> big. But if you can come out of the gates and show a blocking pass, like one of the best feelings being an animator in the dailies room is you show your blocking pass and there's no notes. Yeah. The, the, direct, you know, the director looks at the head of animation, looks at the soups, and they're like, looks good to me. <laughs> the, I know it's so underwhelming, but that is the best feeling. <laughs> it's the absolute best feeling. It's like, all right, good. So I'm in the right ballpark, and then and you just keep going. And you realize um, the more you learn the craft, the more you realize, like, my job as an animator, right, is, is, to, is to service the movie, the film, the sequence, the shot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's not about it's not about you. It's about it's ours, right? It's it's a team effort. Number two, numero cuatro. Cuatro. Um. Uh, again, very simple one, but I wish I knew this when I was starting out in the industry. It's okay to be stuck. Mm. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay not to get a particular style. Um, 
instead of locking your door or putting your headphones on and just having diarrhea and your stomach doing flips <laughs> and having and sweating, right? I, <laughs> I've been there, like sweating of like, oh shit, they're gonna realize I'm a fraud. <laughs> There's no way I can do this. I am sucking. That feeling that when you hit play in your first blocking pass and it's a disaster. <laughs> right? Take a breath. It's gonna be cool, man. Like it's gonna be fine. Get your soup in, get a, an animator you trust. Even better, get an animator that you normally don't ask for a critique that's really good. Shut bring them in and go, dude, I am struggling. Can you please help me? This is what I'm trying to do. This is my live action reference. One, you'll be surprised at how much they're going to want to help you. Because um, I used to love that. Like, I remember, I remember specifically being at Disney when, you know, you're there now for 10, 12, 13, 14 years, and, and the newer animators are pulling you aside. It feels good. It's a really nice feeling. To know like, oh, that artist trusts me mm. enough that they want, they're, they're asking me for my honest opinion. Colin, you have no idea how many times my first few years in the industry that I eat that. I went home and, and just struggled with it. Had anxiety, right. panic attacks of like, this is my livelihood. Because listen, the thing that we balance going in into the field of animation is we're balancing this behemoth responsibility of I am animating these shots in this movie. This movie right. should be seen by a lot of people. I love my job and I want to be here and I want this to be my life. And you just have to put things in context. Animating one bad shot is not going to ruin your career. <laughs> That's a silly way of thinking. I thought that way for many, many years. That everything I did, I was going to be, right? And I, listen, I think every animator's, um, I think every animator's secret is, I'm not worthy. Mm. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough to be here. Everyone else is so much better than me. That's bullshit. Of course you deserve to be there or you wouldn't be there. Right. Right? So like, you know, get and then you'll be surprised like two shots later you do something where it's the complete opposite. You animate something and it's like, well, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. I did yeah. that. That's yeah, that's pretty good. And then before you know it, you got an extra bounce in your step in the hallway and then the shot that you do next week is like, oh, shit, here we go. Yeah, why, why? <laughs> totally. Well, animating or doing any creative endeavor from a face of a place of fear, you're not going to do your best work, right? Like if you go into a shot going like, I don't know, I'm so scared and I'm going to get fired. And you're, well, you're, you've kind of knocked yourself down at the knees already. You're, you're, you're starting from negative. Yeah. So that, um, ask questions. It's okay. Um, Listen, to be completely honest, you have no idea being a rookie animator or first-time lead or first-time director. You have so much to learn. Right. That if anyone is going to shit on you, fuck them. <laughs> right. Right? Like, dude, art is so hard that if you, if you're, if you have the hubris to actually be critiquing someone in the, in, the, in the correct context of them learning and you're judging them, you don't get it. Right. Like, 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 like you said, you know, before Colin, we're, as artists, the really hard thing about being in this industry is you critique sometimes twice a day. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like, dude, think about, like, you know, animators need to know that. Like, you're going to get into production once the, the train starts moving, um, there's a good chance that you're going to be showing your work twice a day. <laughs> and you're going to be dealing with critiques twice a day. You accept the fact that you're going to learn. Every shot's going to make you better. 
you're worth it, you deserve to be there. And if you think that you're getting the vibe that you that people are doubting you, use that fuel. Use that fuel, study, you know, uh, um, um, <clears throat> watch great animation, uh, get critiques often, but use that fuel to be great. Yeah, yeah. Nice. All right. On that and note, number be great. Three. Number three. <laughs> Dude, I hope I'm not babbling. I feel like I'm babbling. No, no. This is all great stuff. So, um, oh man, this is this is one for the first time leads. <laughs> First time supervisors, first time leads, and this has not, this is across the whole field of animation and filmmaking. If you give an artist a critique and the artist goes in that direction, when you are in dailies, as a lead and as a supervisor, as a head of animation, as a director, as a producer, you have to take responsibility if that <laughs> artist is crashing and burning because of your critique. Right. You as a supervisor have to be vocal and save that artist. Now, it's a really hard thing to do because it goes against all your intuition that when an artist is being torn down by the director that I don't like this. This is not what I wanted. What were you thinking? Sometimes it gets brutal in there. Mm -hmm. And the last thing you want to do as a lead is be like, um, actually, uh, that's my bad. And a lot of times, unfortunately, I see this a lot, is the room is quiet. And that right. poor animator is like thrown under the bus. Like drowning. <laughs> and it's like, and listen, here is the beauty of this. Here's the beautiful thing that that again, I wish I knew when I became a lead. When you speak up in that room, it can be a staff meeting, it can be casting. When you speak up in that room and you take responsibility for that mistake, one, the negativity in the room completely vanishes in that instant. It goes right. away. And here's the crazy thing, is that you look responsible, you look good by taking the ownership. It's a very mature thing to do. Right, yeah, it now, is. You know, I'm not at Disney anymore and I'm in the independent space and I'm working on a few things. But if I only told you how many emails and text messages and phone calls I have with colleagues at different studios and friends telling me like that son of a bitch hung me out to dry. <laughs> it happens from like veteran leads. Right, right. To it. You owe it to the artist. They're busting their ass, working overtime to make the movie look as great as it can. Be again, dude. Talk about going full circle. Be kind, right? Be kind, yeah. to fellow artists. Be respectful. Be honest, but have tact. And um, and yes, bail and speak up. Yeah. Number two. Number two. I made a sign finally. Oh, I love it. Now we have graphics. <laughs> well, my budget show. That's right. We got a graphics department here. Number two. We're getting up here in high in priority now, right? This is like we're in the top two, man. This is big. This is the second most important advice I can give to people getting into the industry. Number two. Find a mentor it's not good enough to be at the studio and getting critiques and all of that stuff my career 
took a huge jump when I said to myself, all right, these two people, they're going to be my people, right? They're going to be artists that um, I'm, I'm going to look for guidance and leadership, and I'm going to, I'm gonna, I, I want to be like them. Um, mm. So, and no one ever told me that, right? My first many years, no one ever told me you need to, you need to find someone. You need to like, who do you, whose work do you love? Mm. Whose work do you think that they're just so much better than you? You know, you may never be as good as them. Who is that person? Ask that person if you could, if they can mentor you. There's a very good chance they're going to say yes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care who they are. They're going, right? It works for everyone. They get to go back to basics human interaction, working with young artists, it feels good for everyone. Yeah, yeah. That's my number two. That's big. You get to the studio, be kind, <laughs> find people, find an artist that you're like, I, that I'm, that person's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. And, and, um, and, and ask them for help. Find a mentor. Find a mentor. And hey, listen, and you can't find a mentor. Um, I'm sure we can arrange something where I would love, you know, maybe through the school, I would love to help people as well. So if you don't have somebody and you're looking for somebody, maybe we can arrange something. Amazing. Amazing. We'll take you up on that. You are number one. And this is number one. The big number one. The big Huna. This is the number one thing I wish somebody would have told me <laughs> when I got into animation. Your job as an animator is to service the director's vision, and that is all. Mm. Your job as an animator is to address the notes and service the movie. Listen, I know that sounds, how can that be your number one? Of course. <laughs> but I'm telling you, when you become an animator and you're working and you're busy, it's easy to lose perspective. It is not your movie. And <laughs> I would go as far as to say, you're not there to show off either. If someone would have told me when I first started, Dino, as long as you address the notes from the director and the supervisor, as long as every time you're going back into dailies and those notes are addressed, you will be a rock star. <laughs> and you will have work in this industry forever. People will always want to work with you. Now, listen to what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, don't go in there and, and hit a home run. Don't try to go in there and blow everyone away. Look how, look how crafty, look how unique, look at the style, look at the squash and shred. Look at look at my breakdown. Look at my in between. Look at look I. <clears throat> that's cool. <laughs> but if you can service the director's notes, and every time you come back, they're giving you new notes that are furthering your shots, and they become polished notes. You, they'll ask you to stay. They just will, and that's something I did not know. Mm. I did not know that when I first started at Dream Quest that turned into the Disney gig. I thought every time I was issued something, fuck, I need to show them my chops. <laughs> oh man, like I need to I, I saw some guy, you know, I saw another artist. I saw this girl doing this really cool squash and stretch thing. I need to put that in my shot. And then <laughs> you do it, and they're like, why the fuck are you doing that? <laughs> yeah, that's so true. Your job as an animator. The, the sooner you accept this, the sooner you will be asked to come back to the studio. 
Your job is to service the director's vision. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a director now. I can say that because I was a, a junior animator, an animator, a lead animator, a supervising animator, the head of animation, and a director. I'm looking at it from all of those different perspectives. If someone would have told me the first five years working at Disney, my sole job is to service the director's vision. And if I'm in conflict with the supervisor, which does happen, and it will happen, all you need to ask the supervisor is, can I bring the shot the way I'm thinking about it to dailies? Mm -hmm. Just ask the supervisor that. Can, is it okay if I do that? There's a good chance the soup will say yes. Um, and then from that moment on, once you get your blocking notes, when you bring it back for work in progress, where you're, where you're in betweening, as long as you're addressing the notes, all animators, do me a favor. Go on to Instagram and go on to Twitter. Tell me that you, you understood this. Hashtag just do the notes. <laughs> right? Just like this, like promise. Get that trending. If any, if I can do anything for an artist to help make you successful in this industry is, um, is get your acting right and address the notes. Everything else is going to come in time. Your arcs and your polish and your in-betweening and your spacing. All of that stuff is going to happen. And it's a long journey. And it's a wonderful journey. And man, we have the best jobs. We get to play make-believe for a living. Yeah. yeah. The simple fact of just do the notes, address the notes, um, is going to make your, your, your early, the early part of your career that much more enjoyable. So right. that's, that's my top 10 list. Top 10 list. What an awesome top 10 list. I hope everyone was taking notes out there uh, and, and just do those notes. Take all of the top 10 and just do those notes and you'll, and you'll be fine. <laughs> so maybe to, because one of the things, you know, you're talking about there then is receiving director's notes and, and, and addressing them. You just directed a movie and you're going to be directing more movies. This is the first movie you've directed. What, advice would you give a first time director you know this is a long way away for most of the people watching right now um i've got a small amount of directing experience but you know in terms of you know feature film you're, you're kind of keeping that disney vibe going that that rhythm of how to make a film you know what what advice would you give yourself as a first time director so um again keeping in the theme of things i wish i knew um, for all of you that are thinking about going into directing short or a feature, or you have an idea that you're really compelled by, um, uh, you, you how, how do I put this? Um, that thing that you pitch, the thing that gets you excited about the project, you can never lose sight of that. You can never ever, so here's, here's the phenomenon that is filmmaking. <coughs> One day I, I have an idea and I am so amped by it. Oh my goodness. Like right now I'm, I'm in development on a few projects right now. Um, uh, uh, and they're, they're for different platforms. And all of these things, there are things that I need to do. I need to tell this story. I need to work on, work on, on them. Um, and one of them is an Italian project. And the thing I would tell first time directors is that thing that you pitch the studio executives when you're doing the dog and pony or you're in the studio and you're either doing it via Zoom, uh, uh, or in person, when you, when it clicks for the executives and they, and this may happen, um, some, you know, they may be interested in the room, in your project. You have to remember that that's the thing that they're buying. 
the, the, mm. there's an idea that that's very emotional to you. And here is where the thing that no one tells you when you're going into a directing gig. You need to remember that thing for three years. <laughs> that thing is going to be stretched. It's going to be contested. It's going to be poked. It's going to be pulled. You're going to be challenged. Executives and producers are going to change it on you. You have to write it. Put it in your pocket. Pin it up. Put it on a note in your phone. Make it your desktop. Write this phrase that is going to be your, your north star, your true north. That's going to be your direction for these three years. Look at it. Mm. And, and you have to promise yourself Yes, there are battles you can't fight that you're not going to win. But man, there is a battle that you have to fight. And it's the DNA, it's the emotional core of why the F you're even directing. <laughs> listen, at the end of the day, when that movie's out in the world, no one gives a shit about your trials and tribulations, the battles you won, the battle you lost. Your movie is going to find an audience. Sometimes it's small, sometimes it's big. And if you're not 100% true to yourself, it's, it's going to be a tough pill to swallow when you're sitting there watching your movie and you're going to realize like, um, yes, I'm, I'm really proud of the work that I'm doing, <clears throat> but are there are certain battles I should have fought, probably. And as a first time director, I have breaking news for everyone is the reason why studios really like first time directors is, you know, they're able to get what they want. <laughs> they can direct the director. Because you don't know, you don't know what you don't know. So mm -hmm. I wish I would have, um, you know, with all the different projects I'm developing, I've got this little thing now written in, in my notes that when I'm opening up my notebook, for that specific project, it's on page one, right? This is my idea. This is why I'm attached to it. Um, so I wish somebody would have told me that. Um, right. Uh, and Amazing. hopefully this has been helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think that can just be in general, just for any artistic pursuit you do is just remember why you're doing it in the first place, right? Like find your voice within and, and, and be fearless in it. And that can be hard when you got other voices trying to, trying to stomp on it right you just got to be like no here's here's why we're doing this and i'm the only one that can can bring it to life so um that's awesome well the top 10 and then plus a bonus one for directors so we're going to go to some questions here um and this is kind of a classic quint question from uh Al alonso here thanks alonso for your question uh he actually asked this kind of right at the beginning is how did you get to work in such great companies after film school so i mean this is kind of a general question but it's going to be different for everyone, but maybe just kind of walk us through what do you think, what do you think was the reason why you got into Disney right away? Like what was there, like, was it just the work? Was it, was there other things going on? It wasn't just your demo reel was, or was it weighted, you know, 90% demo reel? Yeah. You know what? Um, the, the, re the reason why I became an animator is, was, uh, uh, um, uh, was because of the acting, the performance part of it. Mm. Um, and uh, so I made sure that my acting on the reel if anything stood out I wanted to show fresh choices surprising choices um, but listen as a student you're always without even knowing you're always going to be kind of cliche <laughs> um, but I was aware of that so I wanted to kind of do some fresh stuff and um, and listen, the stars were aligned and uh, the people, you know, at the at Dream Quest that was owned by Disney, at the time they were doing Mighty Joe Young uh, with CG Gorilla. Mm. Um, uh, and then, you know, they were getting segueing into feature animation. And I guess they liked my acting. Uh, um, Yes, that's that's cool. Nice. Uh, we we don't have a question here. We just have someone who's going to compliment you, Joel Eden. I worked at Disney Animation Studios. 
interaction designer in the animation technology group during Frozen and Big Hero 6. Lena was the nicest person. Dude seemed to care so much about teaching others and bringing up everyone's level to great final film results. And absolutely, uh, you've just proven that again. So there you go. Thanks, Joel. Thanks, Joel. Hope you're well, man. Awesome. Thanks for joining us, Joel. Uh, Paulina has a, has a great question here. Just kind of a general question. What has been your most exciting project? What's your favorite project you've worked on? Probably the, the latest one, I would imagine. <laughs> That's what it's always is for me. Uh, uh, that's a hard question. I would, have, I would say the, the movie that, um, where I feel like I became, sounds so weird, but I, I think the project where I became the animator that I wanted to be was Tangled. Mm. Um, I, I, the shots I got were incredibly challenging. I put myself out of my comfort zone. Um, uh, and Glenn Keane, this is so silly. I'm even saying this, but I'm going to. Um, Glenn Keane came by in my office one day to compliment me on a shot that I animated. Wow. And um, and I was literally skipping for two weeks in the hallway. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm done. My, drop, you know, drop the mic drop moment. And um, but tangled for me. And then, um, yeah, Playmobil for me is you know it's from from going into the room and pitching an idea to it going out into the world is a big deal. I'm really proud of that. Um, yeah. The things, are, you know, that I learned along the way that, you know, I'll get to do my next projects. Um, but it's, it's been a wonderful journey. And I feel very fortunate. And, and, um, uh, and it's just cool, man. Like, again, like, listen, this, this thing of like, oh my God, it sounds so cool to be working in animation. It's better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Than you even imagine when you're sitting there in the theater and your shot comes up. It's goose bumpy. It's it's you're out of your body. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And you know, tenfold for me, you know, being in Paris and watching Playmobil with an audience that loved that, that were fans of the Playmobil toys. That is like um it's it's like I remember being an animator and being in LA and watching my shots come up in a movie theater on the big screen. <laughs> and if you're working something that's emotional, it gets really quiet. Or you're working on a on a on a on a punchline, you're working on a gag or something funny, and the whole audience erupts. And you did that. You manipulated all of those people <laughs> in that room. Um, it's a one, you guys are on the right track. You guys are, yes, go into animation. You're going to love it. I still get giddy thinking about it. I love my job. <laughs> yeah. It's so true, right? And it's, you know, it, just to speak to like Playmobil, it's like, it's damn hard to get a movie made. So, just even having it made is amazing. And like, just being super proud of that is, is, is fantastic. Um, Rebecca has got, we got, we got a keen eyed uh, viewer here. Rebecca is asking about, uh, you know, what is that concept art behind you? Any, any secrets you're holding back from us there? <laughs> Very keen eye. Um, so some of the artwork down there is from my uh, movie based on Italian mythology. It takes place in Northern Italy. Uh, listen, as an Italian American, um, Sicilian, growing up in New York, you know, American movies, I'm fucking sick and tired of Sicilians being portrayed as criminals. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm tired of it. And as mo Italians are mobsters, every time they're in movies, listen, I'm the biggest Martin Scorsese fan there is. But fuck, man. Like, so listen, this is my responsibility. Go, I, I've been to Italy quite a few times before the virus started. Um, that's my dad calling. <laughs> there you go. It's like someone was listening. On, on cue. 
you can't <laughs> agree with me. Um, but like, this is my story to tell, right? This, this is my story. I, as an Italian American, my parents moved from Italy to New York so I can have a better life. This is my, this is for me to tell. Um, uh, and th there's going to be, so, there's an announcement that's going to be coming out soon. Um, and the technique we're using is really, really cool. It looks very different. Um, uh, but yeah, um, the, the movie's called Battleist, uh, and there's going to be some more info coming out very, very soon. Um, uh, I can't really say much because I'm sure if I, <laughs> I have a lot of people uh, wanting to kill me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, listen, if you're anyone with Italian heritage out there, I'm going to try to do our culture proud. <laughs> awesome. I can't wait, man. Uh, it's just so awesome that you're taking that personal angle on something. I think it's so, it's so important, you know, in, in our, in our storytelling world right now to, to have those kind of voices out there. It's, it's fantastic. Um, moving on here, Terry Kennedy's got a question. Oh, we got an Adam, Adam Lambert uh, fan. Uh, how involved was Adam Lambert in the creation of the character of Emperor Maximus? Did he help with any writing of the music? Um, oh my goodness, Adam. Um, so the, the real, here's a really cool thing about creating a movie and, 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 and directing is you're, you're in a story room with people and this, <clears throat> this fictional character gets created that eventually is going to have a real person doing, being that character. So <coughs> Adam Lambert was one of those people where um, I have to give my wife credit here. When my wife started seeing the sketches for Emperor Maximus and she read the script and she went to screenings and saw the animatics, she's like, there's only one person that can play this role. <laughs> And the minute she said Adam Lambert, it was like, oh my. And then I met Adam and I took <coughs> the idea. He was so wonderful. Um, and working with him was a blast. He overachieved on everything. <laughs> we did a few different days of reading the, you know, for the, for the part, the dialogue, and then doing the song in the studio. And a lot of, performers, especially the songs, their first two takes are usually like, oh, I, that, that's great. Like, wow. Sometimes it starts going off the rails. Holy shit, Adam, every take, he's getting better and better and better. And it was just like, holy shit, this dude is so talented. <laughs> um, and then I'm not going to bullshit you guys all the projects that I'm, you know, the projects that I'm developing right now, I'm writing a part for Adam in every movie. <laughs> um, he's a genuinely wonderful person. He gives you everything he has. Um, and those are the people I want to work with. He's incredibly talented. Um, uh, yeah. How, how are you? What a great guy. Oh, that's awesome. Hey, Terry had a follow-up question there, by the way. What's your favorite kind of pizza? I mean, guys, listen. <laughs> There's, let's get serious here, okay? <laughs> this is a big question of the day. I, got, I have a pizza question here, so let's not mess around. <laughs> there's, there's, two, there's two kinds of pizza. There's pizza in Italy, and then there's New York pizza. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay? If it's over two inches thick, it's casserole. It's not pizza. <laughs> All right. So listen, I love everyone from Illinois. <laughs> I love my Chicago people. But guys, that's bull. That's not pizza. I am sorry. <clears throat> There's good pizza in LA. I found some good pizza in Montreal. Long Island has some of the best pizza. Yeah. Uh, but my... Yeah, it's New York style pizza. And then when you're in Italy, go to Napoli and you'll have the best pizza on planet Earth. Yeah, totally. We were actually, I was, I, we were honored last time you came out. We went for a pie and 
Lino just told them what to make and it came and it was, I don't think they've made a better pie in that restaurant either before then or after. So I'm honored to have had that. I pizza. need to write a book about how I made pizza in New York and became an animator for Disney. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> awesome. Well, we've got, actually, we've got a question here. Speaking of New York, uh, let me find it here. Um, Michael, first off, just wanted to say that as an Italian American animation student from New York, Long Island specifically in the house, uh, your journey has been a real inspiration to me. Uh, and his question is, since you're a director with Roots as a CG animator, what do you personally enjoy seeing on demo reels? Uh, you mentioned subtle performances, but is there anything else that you do see much of now that you'd like to see an upcoming, you know, like what would be a fresh thing to put into to your demo reel? It's a very common question, by the way. And yeah. I, I grabbed the one from the, from the Long Island uh, yeah. attendee here. Yeah. Um, cool. Cool. Now you're from Long Island. Um, uh, uh, so here, uh, if your if your goal is to become an animator, um, you need your hundred percent focus. Again, this is only my opinion. Um, needs to be performance. Needs to be acting. Mm. Now, uh, yes, there there are animators like. Let me tell you, like some of these game cinematics and some of the stuff I've been seeing in the games industry, holy shit, it's so good. <laughs> um, but like, if you can take a simple character and make them emotionally, um, have, if they have a soul, and when you're watching that reel for that moment, you buy everything that they're doing and they're saying, you're going to find a gig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And here, here's something that's really interesting that I've been finding. There are so many rigs, right? There's character, um, there are characters articulated you can get for free. We all know the usual suspects, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Here's what's really funny is if you can take one of those characters that you've seen in online a gazillion times and you can make that dude stand out, you're getting a job. Right. Because a lot of us see like, oh man, that's oh, it's not that good. And it's like, but if you can make that ca character rig that everyone has seen before, oh my God, look like like the smart acting. Um uh yeah, <laughs> you're gonna find awesome. the same. Yeah. I mean, it's just it just feels fresh too when you're like, well, I've seen that character do the same thing 50 times, and then whoa, what you did this with that character? Yeah, I love seeing that stuff. Um, we've got about 10, 15 minutes here uh, of Lino's time. And actually, there's there's a lot of compliments here, by the way, Lino. A lot of people thanking you for their time. And you've yeah. really inspired them today. Um, but a couple, couple of questions have come up very similar in terms of books. Uh, can you recommend any like animation-related books or acting books that you rely on or, or something that you've read lately that really helps? So, um, uh... Uh, for for those of you that want to learn the craft of acting um, uh, and, and go you know one step further than the great stuff that they're you know you'd be learning in school, obviously watch really really good movies. Mm. But Warner Laughlin is someone I mentioned before. She's an acting coach for a Amy Adams, Ryan Reynolds. Oh goodness, so many more. Um, <laughs> out of Los Angeles and I use her for all my projects she has a book out um, and oh my god it's I'm drawing a blank on it <laughs> look, look her up her name is Warner Laughlin um, acting coach um, buy her book better yet take her course um, on a weekend or like one of these lectures or maybe you know Colin Warner and I we can do something all together and put on some kind of like acting masterclass. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, for me, for me, I just wish, I wish I knew the craft of acting as I was learning animation so that my stuff didn't look like it was animated with a capital A. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> uh, and then for anyone that wants to learn about screenwriting or directing, um, I've got this book next to me. 
the uses of enchantment by Bruno, uh, by Bruno uh, Bettelheim. Mm. Talks about the value of fairy tales and um, um, goodness, it's such a great book that talks about story structure and what they have in common and why they're so important for, 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 for us as the general public to listen to fairy tales and for children. Um, and then the obvious one that if you don't know that everyone references is Save the Cat. Mm. Um, uh, but, and then there's the, the illusion of life. Right. Uh, Can't go wrong with that one. That one, if you read 50 times, you get 50 different things out of it. That's a, that's a good thing. Somebody asked a question about vacation, uh, which I'm going to get to in a second. But yeah, read, read, read Illusion of Life by the Pool. I did that once. It was the best vacation ever. Um, mostly because half the book I read, I was drunk. So, you know, margaritas, right? <laughs> then I really, then it really opened my mind. Um, there's a great, great question here about, and this is kind of topical maybe, but, and you had talked about downtime earlier and practice and stuff, but how do you deal with like work-life balance? You know, like, you know, especially as a director, you got to put a lot of hours in, you know, do you have any tips for people to deal with like yeah. stress or anxiety and that type of stuff? Yeah. So, um, this is something that was very, very, very important to me as, a, as, as leadership at Disney feature animation. Um, uh, you all know this, obviously, so I'm going to say the obvious, <laughs> nothing is more important than your family. Nothing. Do not miss your children's birthday, big life events, your anniversary, going home when you can, breaking up your overtime, nothing. If a studio makes you feel guilty for anything having to do with your family, that is unfair. Right. It was very important to me as leadership at Disney working on Tangled and Frozen, especially Frozen as the head of animation, I hope that came across to the crew there. I don't care if your shot is due that night. Um, see your family. Do what you have to do with your family. They're, we're going to figure a way of finishing the movie. <laughs> no one should be sacrificing time with your children, with your spouse. So again, if a studio is making you feel like you've got to compete, with time with your family by not going, you know, not having a Saturday with them, seeing them on an evening where you're putting in a 60 hour work week and you just want two nights with them, something is wrong. Your yeah. alarm bell should be going off. I all, listen, maybe I'm selfish. I always found time to be with my family. Um, listen, uh, you know, my, my timing was good. My son was born the day after animation wrapped on Frozen. <laughs> I didn't plan that, but listen, um, I need to do work. I was already cast for the next movie. I took three months off to be with my baby. Right, right. Right? Listen, family is very important to me. Um, and I think every man should be home with their babies, with their kids. It's very important to me that I be with my wife. My mm -hmm. wife was breastfeeding. I, when my wife wakes up at night and she's taking care of the baby, I wanted to take care of my wife. Right. Right? Like, um, yeah, like, I mean, God, family is number one. Uh, yeah. Dude, we're going to have another hour conversation about work. Yeah. Life. Work-life balance, exactly. I know that's the one thing that I'm loving about working from home right now is I just get all those hours of commuting are now going into my family. It's not like I'm doing something different. I'm just spending, we're actually having breakfast together and lunch and we're making Italian style. I feel like I'm becoming Italian, actually. I'm spending so much time with my family and eating so well. <laughs> um, we got another question here. Maybe time for two more questions. Um, this is a good one about, uh, you'd mentioned shooting a uh, live action reference. Uh, there's some questions here about kind of like the importance of that. Uh, maybe some tips on on getting the most out of your your live action reference. Um, 
So number one, it takes a lot of uh, getting used to seeing yourself. Um, it's really strange. The way I would do it is I would literally just loop the audio, have my camera rolling, and I would just keep doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it, stop, take a break, go, go back, and really put myself in the right state of mind. And the exercise that I would do is if I could only pick one expression, what the hell am I doing? What mm. expression is all of this happening through? Because a lot of times in animation, our, sh the, our shot is so short that if there is a, 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 an expression change, it's either subtle or really obvious. So I usually would tell myself, and again, this is from watching Glenn Keane anime, his stuff is so, his acting, is, his pose is so strong that you can just a, a, do all your acting through it. <laughs> I, would, I would force myself, um, like for, I, I animated the, a lot of shots with Flynn tied in the chair with Rapunzel's hair. And for me, like, Flynn had this thing of like, really? Like, <laughs> like, like, seriously? And I remember just, like, what is that? This thing of like, what is this, what are you talking about? And then <laughs> all of my acting was like coming through that. Mm -hmm. That's like his base level kind of like being, right? Yeah, so I think a lot of a animators, they make, they make the misstep of starting neutral and then the, they progress through their live action reference. No, get B there already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really sad. The lip smack and the... Be there, let the dialogue happen and see what your lips are doing and... Um, uh, but yeah, try yeah, to... Yeah. Get Think of what your max is and then just hang around in that. Right. And at the end of the day, it's still just reference. You're just supposed to refer to it. You know, <laughs> don't, don't be married to it, right? Uh, well, we've got, uh, we've got time for like one last question. I think this is kind of a great one to end on based on what we've talked about. We've got the top 10. We've got an, a bonus uh, advice for first time directors and we've got all these amazing answers from you. So my final question to you then uh, Lino is, is, you know, you mentioned get, get finding a mentor. You've had, I'm sure, amazing mentors throughout your career, uh, maybe a couple of key ones. What's the, is there one or two pieces of advice that you got that just went right through your core and were like, have stuck with you for, for forever? And it could have even been lately, but just something that came from someone you trust that really struck, struck a chord with you. Um, hmm. And kind of putting you on the spot there. No, it's like, I'm just, there's so much, oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm going to have to go back to Tangled. Uh, I, I think it's, God, I sound like a, a broken record. I'm so sorry, but. No, it just underscores the point, maybe. It's the, it's the emotion. It's the, mm. it's just getting that character to feel convincing. Um. And you know what, Here, here's something, maybe it's this, maybe it's this, I'll get this specific. Listen to what's happening between the dialogue. Mm. Because as animators, you're given a dialogue, right? This is what you're gonna to animate to. What is happening in between those words? There's been many times, let me tell you, where I felt the dialogue was a little too fast and I wanted to do something emotionally <clears throat> and I stretched the break in between the words to give myself a, a breath so that mm. we could deliver. And I would tell the editor that, I would run it by the director. What is happening between the words? Is the character licking their lips? We do that often, I do that. Mm -hmm. Are you swallowing? Are you blinking, preparing to say something? Is your head dipping? Are you intently listening? Are you, are you clenching your jaw? What's ha too many times I, I'm seeing first passes from animators where they're, pan they're, they're like, um, uh, the, the dialogue is ba-ba-ba, da-da-da, ba-da-ba, 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 ba-da-ba. And the acting is 
And it's mimicking the dialogue instead of like, what, what the heck are they doing in the, during the quiet moments of the dialogue? Um, uh, and, and that, right, that's going to be, that's gonna, I think it's going to make a big, really, really, really big difference. Yeah, yeah. It's like what also what's happening underneath the dialogue, right? Like the, because what we say is not always what we mean, right? There's like a subtext to everything we do and being able to bring that out in performance is like, oh man, when I see that stuff, that's, that's honestly why I end up, that's why I keep going back to animated movies and just, because I know a good animated movie is going to just n n deliver those kind of performances that yeah, are crafted guys, around that. Guys, listen, watch that scene again in Spider-Verse where the dad is talking to his son through the door. Yeah. There's so little going on, but God damn, those eyes, right? Like the, the characters are emotionally where they need to be in just the littlest shift and a little bit of brightness and that little bit of acknowledgement. It makes you feel like, dude, those characters are real. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome stuff. Well, now we all need to go and watch Spider-Verse tonight. It's homework. So good. <laughs> so good. I love, was there, there was a tweet the other day from one of the, direct, the producers and directors that they saw some of the concept art from the second one and it's going to make the first one look like quaint. So, <laughs> man, we're in, we're in for something else. Oh, I, I can't you. wait. <laughs> well, Lino uh, and, and, and audience, thank you guys so much. Thank you for everyone to, for joining today. Lino, thank you so much for taking some time again with us. We just, we just super appreciate your generosity of your time. Um, you know, we know it's different time zone for you there going on bedtime, I'm sure for, for the little ones and we want you to get back to your family and, uh, yeah, man, just thank you for this. Thank you. I always take something away from it selfishly myself and I've done it again. So, uh, yeah, thanks for lighting the fire. Thanks for being the, the, the match. And, uh, we, we thank you so much. And any parting words for everybody? No, like, listen, um, have fun. It's a, it's a wonderful career path. It's a wonderful job. It's a great journey. You never stop learning. Um, and just, just be in the moment and be kind. Be kind to one another. Goodness. It's hard enough as it is to animate. Just be kind to one another. <laughs> yeah. So true, man. So true. Especially, especially, you know, together. We need to be in this together. And, and as creatives, we can, we can lead the way. Uh, yeah, man. Thanks again. Let's, Thank let's do you. this again. Yeah, this is great. Thank you so much for having me, Colin. Oh man, anytime. And yeah, let's let's do an acting thing next time. Let's get let's get Warner in here and let's look at some work and let's break some let's get dirty. Let's get our hands dirty next time and break some shit down. This will be good. Thank awesome. you, everybody. Hey. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all the best to your to your to your wife and kids over there. Stay healthy, stay well. We'll, we'll be definitely talking to you soon, of course. But uh, for everybody else, uh, thank you so much for everything today. Thank you for awesome questions and your engagement. Uh, please be well uh, and be safe. And, and as Lino says, be kind. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night.